Hello everyone, and happy July 4th. Today we are going to see Magnus Carlsen viciously force checkmate on the young grandmaster Sergei Lobanov, who should have won this game from last title Tuesday on chess.com. He had the game in the bag, but oh, you have to be so careful when you're playing against the Magnus. He will find a way to swindle you right out of your hard-earned win. So let's see how this all went down. Magnus Carlsen has the white pieces here. We have this sort of boring Gioco piano, pianissimo setup, whatever you call it. I don't like to play this. A6 here, finally a move that doesn't mimic one of White's moves. A4, Magnus expands on the queen side. We got H6, doesn't want any bishop to G5. Now bishop to E3 from Magnus Carlsen, inviting bishop takes E3. F takes E3, which lands him with the double pawns, but as we all know, it does give him better control of the center. Another pawn influencing these central squares. D6 from Lobanov, castles, castles, nothing too exciting here. A5 gaining some space over there on the queen side. Now bishop to E6, inviting Carlsen to take on E6, which would give Lobanov some more central pawn control and open the F-file for his rook. Carlsen doesn't want that. He just backs up his bishop with the move b3. Now knight to d7, maybe anticipating this bishop takes e6 though at some point, maybe that's why the knight moved over here so that this rook would have an open view, I don't know, or maybe he's going to c5, who knows. Some of these moves are a little mysterious to me in this game, like this one here, queen to e1, maybe queen g3 is the plan, but after knight to b4, attacking c2, Carlson apparently changes his mind and decides d2 is the square for the queen. The strange thing is, both of those moves were top engine moves, queen e1 and queen d2. So there's some subtle stuff going on here. c5 now from Lobanov, defending the knight from any possible discoveries by this queen, if this knight were to move, I guess. But this creates a big hole on d5. Knight to d1 now from Carlson. He just gives up some control of d5. I'm not exactly sure what the knight's plan is at this juncture. Maybe knight to f2 is an idea, but the knight ends up going to b2, as we'll see in a minute. We got b5 from Lobanov. Interesting thing to play. It allows a takes b6 on passant. And after knight takes b6, okay, a6 is a little bit of a target there, but this knight is now more active and is hitting this bishop on c4. Now, if you just allow the knight to take, let's say you play something like h3 is white, knight takes e4, now how are you going to recapture? You recapture with this pawn here, well, that's going to give black a pass pawn. Well, that's maybe not ideal. You take like this, well, now these two pawns are looking pretty weak. I don't know. The engine thinks this is not too bad, actually thinks it favors white, but Carlson didn't really want any of that, so he took on e6 after f takes e6. Now he goes for knight to b2. I guess he sees that most of the action's happening over here on the queen side and wants that knight to be a part of it. We got a5 from Lobanov. This probably anticipates the move c3, which is what Carlson plays next. Kicking the knight back to c6. The pawn's defended by the knight. This rook is free to move somewhere. This is a weakness for black. d4, now from Carlson, striking in the center. And we have rook to b8. The engine actually prefers the big trade down on d4, after which the pawn structure will be more or less equivalent. But this move allows a transformation of the pawn structure initiated by Magnus Carlsen with d takes c5, d takes c5, which probably slightly favors white. I mean, look at all these black pawns that can never defend each other. Carlsen still has these two pawns abreast right here. And the engine says right here, do not trade queens, just get your queen off of this open file with queen to e2. But Carlson does what probably a lot of us would do here. Says, I'll trade the queens because my pawn structure is better and that's gonna give me an end game advantage. But after rook f takes d8, the engine says it's about equal. Maybe white has a slight edge. And here Carlson doesn't play the most natural move, challenging the rook on the open file. He goes rook f to c1. I think he's probably seeing a line where this knight is gonna move. He's just gonna let this b pawn go, at which point the c3 pawn will be defended and he can pick up this pawn after knight c4. Knight takes a5, something like that. But this is not what happens. Lobanov gets very frisky, and he plays c4, sacrificing a pawn. I really like this move. The engine doesn't think it's like spectacular or anything, but from a practical standpoint, it's going to create an imbalance, and it's going to give him some very active play. Carlson takes the pawn with the knight. Knight takes, pawn takes, and here comes the rook into b2. He's now got a passed pawn. 
He's infiltrated Carlson's position. This is looking scary. Carlson immediately challenges the rook. It's backed up with the other rook he takes. Rook recaptures, and now he gets his king moving towards the center. It's a good plan. Rook to b3 here, attacking c3. Rook to c1 defends. Here comes the a-pawn. Carlson moves his king closer to the action. We got rook to b2 with check. King to d3, and now a3. What are you doing about this pawn? What are you doing about a2 followed by rook to b1? White is not losing here, but needs to play very accurately, and Carlson actually misses the boat on this one. What you need to play here, well, maybe you want to try to find it. What should White play? There's only one move that doesn't lose, and it's not easy to spot, but you will see the logic to it once I show it to you. What should White play? The necessary defense is rook to f1. It's very important to keep the black king from joining the fight. If the king tries to step onto this open f file now, there's going to be a discovered attack with this knight. It's not going to work out too well for black. And you might be asking, what about a2 followed by rook to b1? Well, we're going to answer that with knight to d2. And if black tries to get the knight involved with knight a5, we're just going to start pushing the c pawn. The king is in no position to stop it. It's cut off from the action. And it's a draw. This knight has babysitting duty. So this was the drawing line for white that Carlson unfortunately did not find. Back here he played a very natural move. This is what we all tend to want to do. Put something in front of the pawn, rook to a1. But now there's a2. Carlson pushes his c pawn. And all Lobanov needs to do here is play king to f7. Just get this king close enough to stop this pawn. But he gets a little impatient and he goes straight for the very natural looking move, knight to a5. The obvious threat here is knight to b3. And here is a moment that demonstrates what an amazing player Magnus Carlsen is. I think a lot of us in this position would say, hey, I'm just going to play knight d2. Got to stop knight b3, right? No choice. But this runs into the unfortunate rook takes d2 check. And after the king captures, you are done because that is a fork. You can get over here with the king. The knight takes with check. You go over here, but you're still not going to get out of this because there's knight b3. The pawn's going to promote. Of course, he could just take the pawn, but now black's piece up. You're done. So, Carlson realized that line was going to be losing in the however many seconds it took him to look at this position and play the amazing knight takes e5. Just allowing knight b3. I'm just going to let my rook go. I don't even care because c6. And Lobanov no longer has the win, despite the fact that he can take out the rook. c7. The pawn is unstoppable. But wait a minute, you might say, what about knight b3? Carlson queens his pawn, and the king hides over here on h7. How are you stopping this? Black's going to be a piece up, right? Well, Carlson has a very sinister plan right here, which begins with knight to f7. Setting a trap, creating a relatively rare situation where the promotion of the pawn is actually a big blunder. What black needs to play here? Well, there's a few different moves he can play. I'll just show you one of them. Rook takes g2, for example. And I'm going to show you why a move like this is necessary after what was played in the game, which was the promotion of the pawn. This allows Carlsen a forced mate in five moves, beginning with queen to h8 check, the king goes to g6, knight to e5 check. Okay, let's look at a few options. What was played in the game was king h5, but let's look at king f6. This would mate in three with queen to f8 check. If you take the knight, that's mate in one, right? So instead, you go to g5. Then we have queen e7 check, king h5, g4 mate. Okay, let's look at king g5. This mate's even quicker with queen takes g7 check, king h5, and queen g4 mate. Okay, now to what was played in the game. King h5, we got queen to e8 check from Carlsen. And remember how I said rook takes g2 was a move that would save black? Well, here you could play g6 in this case, block the check because the rook and the king would be defending that pawn. Here, of course, it'll just get taken out. So what's played here in the game is king to h4. We have knight to f3 check, king to g4, and queen g6 is checkmate. So how about that? Magnus Carlsen down a whole rook, allowing his opponent to queen his pawn, and then finding this beautiful forced mate in five moves. A very nice comeback from a dead loss position. So thank you for watching. Please subscribe, please like, and please stay tuned for the next video coming soon.